right, good. Um, again, I should pause for just a moment because we, again, we've, we've covered through some pretty heavy stuff. Questions, thoughts, ideas, concerns, panic. Uh, all right, then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll continue on. But our point here in this section, this section which is often a point of confusion, this turn the other cheek section of the Sermon on the Mount, is this illustration that Christians always love. Our life is always poured out for other. No breaks, no vacations. Christianity is a life of always taking the smallest piece of pie, right? Or the smallest patty or the cake or whatever we have over there. But truly, all the time. And it leads us sometimes to do things that seem to go against the grain of what we're told we're supposed to do. Looking out for number one. Looking out for number one is the antithesis of Christianity. So if we've been drilled into our head that we need to look out for number one, we've got hell drilled into our heads. Heaven is where we always look out for other. All right, where we started that great scripture in Philippians, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Okay. Let every man regard other better than himself. And Jesus is pour, Jesus pouring himself out on the cross. And so here we have this case in Corinth where Christians are taking each other to court. And Paul has a real problem with this. But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 6. To have lawsuits at all with one another is defeat for you. I mean, if anyone in the world is supposed to be able to show how to get along, of how to sow peace, of how to live the world of the kingdom of God, it's supposed to be us who are in the kingdom of God. And we're doing this kind of stuff, not just 2,000 years ago, but still doing it. And that's defeat for us. That is a renunciation of everything we're supposed to be about. To have lawsuits at all with one another is defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? Are we so insistent upon our right that we will violate love? Ooh, confrontational. Well, got to think about this. I mean, the words are there. To have lawsuits at all with one another is defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded to live this new way? But you yourselves wrong and defraud, and that even your own brethren. You know, it reminds me of that scripture we looked at in Galatians 5. In fact, let's go there. It's not in your notes. But let's go to Galatians 5. And I believe it was verse 13. When we were talking about freedom. Okay, for you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Okay, so we're set free in order to love. Okay, but he goes on. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But, but, if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you are not consumed by one another. So he's contrasting these two lives. One, we are set free so we can pour ourselves out for other. And the other is where we start consuming one another. If you bite and devour one another, take heed that you are not consumed by one another. That's the life of hell. In contrast to the life we pour out ourselves for other. Does this, this whole idea of, of if you bite and devour one another, take heed, you're not consumed. It's, it's exactly what's going on here in verse 8. But you yourselves wrong in the fraud, and that even your own brethren. You're consuming each other. You're defeating each other. You've given into the way of hell. Why not rather be defrauded than give into the way of hell? But it's not fair. That's right. Nor was the crucifixion. Nor was the incarnation. It wasn't fair. 
It was love. Now, as we mentioned, even love requires wisdom. This doesn't mean we stop lawsuits. This doesn't mean we stop defending ourselves. It means we always do so out of love instead of self. Okay? Think of this. Jesus is dragged before Pilate. This is unfair. This is wrong. <clears throat> Does he defend himself? No. He's more concerned about saving us. Satan rebels against God and rises up with a third of the angels. Does God defend himself? Yes. All right, Satan is cast down, cast out of heaven, and cast down to earth. Paul is latched up to be scourged as a Roman citizen. Does he defend himself? Yes. Okay. Do you know I'm a Roman citizen? Oops. Let's get him down. So there is a time to defend ourselves and there is a time to endure injustice and unfairness. That's the role of wisdom. It's not a matter of, I'm going to love this time and I'm not going to love this, th that time. It's not a matter of, I'm going to look after this guy because it's not so bad, but this is really bad, so I'm going to stick up for myself. No. It's always love. And wisdom is telling us how to love in this case. In this case, I need to defend myself for the sake of all involved and maybe for that person himself too. And in this case, I need to allow myself to be defrauded. Wisdom and love are constants. What we do might change. Okay, as opposed to the righteousness of the Pharisees, as opposed to the way of hell, that loves those you love and hates those you hate. That gets even, gets an eye for an eye. It's not about an eye for an eye. Don't resist evil. Conquer it with love. And try to find the wise way to know how to conquer it with love. Okay? That's our challenge. Wisdom is the key. But God gives us wisdom too. Okay? As, as, a, as a fruit, as a gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay? The wisdom to know how to love. Part of the key to that is detachment. We didn't spend a lot of time discussing detachment, but it's an important part of Christianity. We brought it up when we talked about Ignatius' the story of the 10,000 ducats, right? The, the, the last fellow, the model of righteousness, and we think he's going to give it all away, and he doesn't. He says, well, I might give some away, I might keep some, whatever God wants. The important thing is it doesn't matter. He's not attached to the money. He can do whatever God wants him to do with it. And so it is with us. We must be detached from all things, even that which is closest to us, so that we are then free to choose love and wisdom. Uh, um, again, I don't know if it's in your notes. I added this just recently because it came to mind because it was in the reading from the Catholic liturgy this past Sunday. But go to Luke 14 and verse 26. Luke 14 and verse 26. And again, if you want the latest notes, they're always up on elmontbiblestudy.org, um, in case they're different from the ones you've got there. But Luke 14, 26. So Jesus says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. If we're attached to something else, even our loved ones, even our own life, we cannot be his disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be his disciple. Remember we said put ourselves in cultural context? This isn't, oh, my toe hurts. You know, in first century Judea, if you were taking up your cross, you weren't coming back. And then he gives us a little, little parable here, or analogy. 
For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Okay. He's talking about us, counting the cost of discipleship. Are we really into this Christianity thing? Have we counted the cost of what it means to be a Christian? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation, is not able to finish all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. You know, what king, going to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and take counsel, whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him, who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends an embassy and asks terms of peace. Okay, so counting the cost of following Jesus. So, therefore, whoever of you does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Now, that doesn't mean in practicality that we go out and sell everything. We may, some have. That's not necessarily what renounce means. What renounce means is we have become detached from it. You know, I've got my $10,000 watch. Someone needs it. Eh, it was nice while I had it. Here you go. You know, I have my home that I've slaved for, almost paid off. And if for some reason God wants something else, goodbye. I have my life, and I love it, and it's time. Goodbye. And in some cases even, I have my family, and it's not to be. As hard as that is, goodbye. So, this love is guided by wisdom. But wisdom can never be an excuse for cowardice. There's often a fine line between faith and foolishness, and a fine line between wisdom and cowardice. And it requires wisdom, and it requires honesty. And it requires a closeness to God so we can hear his voice leading us. But it also requires complete renunciation of attachment to anything in life. That's the cost of discipleship. And when we've come to that detachment, now we can live this righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees that says, you struck me on one cheek, I am detached from what you do to me. So therefore I am free to love you. And that may be, here's the other one, and that may be, I'm calling the police. When we are free, have renounced all things, and are attached to nothing, then in wisdom we can say, it is time for me to allow myself to be defrauded. And in this case, no, it is time for me to defend myself. But it's not because I'm attached to what I may lose. It's because I have freely chosen in love. Give to him who asks of you. Do the love in front of you. Christians never stop loving. This isn't the song anymore. This isn't Christian entertainment anymore. This is out. I don't know if I want to come back next week. That kind of stuff. But it is being confronted by the scriptures. When we have come to this point, when we have come to start living the life of the righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, it transforms all of our relationships. Let's go to 1 John 4, 19 to 21.
1 John 4, 19 through 21. We love because he first loved us. Okay, we often come to God initially for our selfishness. We want heaven. We don't want to go to hell. We want to be happy, whatever it might be. Because God has moved towards us. God has initiated love. And by his grace, we begin to love him back. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God should love his brother also. Christians never stop loving, and it changes all of our relationships. So with that in mind, I want to talk about a topic called flow of expectations. I hesitated to put this, this in here. This is, uh, this, is a, this is a Bible study. These are actually notes from a marriage sermon from probably 20 years ago. But it was a very practical illustration of this kind of love and how this kind of love changes our relationships. We talk about the flow of expectations. What are the expectations we have in a relationship? And in which direction do they flow? Is it that we have expectations of the other person in the relationship? Okay, it's flowing inward towards us. I have expectations of them toward me. Or is the flow outward? I have expectations of myself toward them. In our relationships, many of our long-standing, intractable problems, those problematic relationships that just don't seem to get better, are in such an intransient state because the flow of expectations is backwards. So let's take a look at this as a practical illustration, and also so you can see my brilliant artwork. Um, but here we have a, a relationship, okay, a carnal relationship, to use a, a King James term, a fleshly relationship, a one without the Spirit of God guiding it, a very human relationship. It's, it's Jack and Jill, okay, and they get along really, really well. They just love to walk up a hill together, they love fetching that pail of water, and they even enjoy tumbling down the hill together. And in their relationship, they're reinforcing each other. So Jill has these expectations of Jack, you know, that he is always going to love to walk up the hill and fetch the pail of water with me and come tumbling down. Okay? And Jack likewise has these expectations of Jill towards him, you know, that Jill is always going to love to walk up the hill and fetch the pail of water and go tumbling down together. Right? So they're both happy in this relationship. Okay, here we have a Christian relationship built a kind, upon the kind of love that we're talking about. The love of the righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees. They're still both happy, but you notice the arrows go the other way. Jill has expectations of herself that she is going to accompany Jack up the hill and help him fetch that pail and go tumbling down. And likewise, Jack has expectations of himself that he is going to go up the hill for Jill. Oh, rhymes. And, uh, <laughs> and, and fetch that pail of water and go tumbling down. Okay, but life goes on. Okay, so they marry because they're so happy walking up the hills together. And for a couple of years, they walk up the hills and they tumble down the hills. And they walk up the hills and they tumble down the hills. And they walk up the hills and they tumble down the hills. And life is just as happy and as dreamy as it can be. You know, but the years go by and a couple of kids come along and the arthritis settles into the knees. You know, Jack's got this office position and he's, he's kind of stuck in the office all day. And so life has changed a little bit. You know, Jill really doesn't like going up and down the hills all that much. She's kind of tired from looking after the kids. The arthritis in the knees makes it kind of tough. And every time she falls down, she sprains her knee again. You know, and Jack is just so sick of sitting every day, all these hours, 12 hours a day in the office. He just really, really, really needs to go walking up that hill. 
you know, and getting some exercise so he doesn't die of a heart attack by the time he's 50. And so we've got a problem. Because those expectations that Jill has of Jack towards herself are not being met. Jill wants him to spend more time at home and maybe play mahjong or something. You know, just something that's not so hard on the knees anymore. You know, spend a little more time helping around the house. And she's not getting that from Jack. The, the flow of expectations has been cut off. And she's unhappy. You know, and Jack is just really, he, he's got to get out. He's just going stir crazy in the office. He's got to walk up that hill. And Jill is just not doing that with him anymore. You know, and so his flow of expectations is cut off because it was coming inward. And Jill is not providing that anymore. And so our currently minded couple have become very unhappy. But in our Christian relationship, those flows are not cut off. Why? Because they weren't coming inward. Jill still maintains this outward flow towards Jack. That she's not disappointed if he's not able to meet her expectations of him. She is just trying as much as she can to give to him, to maybe try to find that time, that energy, do what she can do to go up that hill every once in a while and accompany him. Well, maybe she can't. But it, it doesn't change the relationship. Likewise, Jack expects of himself to take care of Jill. And so, yes, you know, maybe sometimes he needs to go walking up that hill alone because he needs the exercise. And sometimes he says, no, I'm going to stay home and play mahjong and help out with some of the housework. Because his expectations are of himself toward Jill. So the flow is never cut off. Right? In, the, in the previous one, when the flow came from Jack towards Jill, Jill was expecting it in, I'm sorry, when Jill's expecting it from Jack, and Jack has stopped flowing, okay, the flow's cut off. Likewise, you know, Jill has stopped flowing towards Jack, and the flow's cut off, because circumstances changed. In this case, the foundation of the relationship hasn't changed. Jill still maintains expectations of herself towards Jack and tries to meet them as best she can. And Jack still maintains his expectations of himself flowing outward towards Jill, right? To meet as much as he can for her. So let's look at some, some practical ways in which this can manifest itself. It may seem silly, but let's, let's walk through it. And we'll actually tie it back to scripture and show how getting this wrong has led to some painful, dangerous misinterpretations of scripture. So here we have a husband and wife dialogue, right? I find it. Is it in there? There we go. All right, so here's the wife's lament okay, from 20 years ago. You know, my dad used to press the clothes for mom and help with the chores. Why doesn't my husband? And he expects me to do all the things his mom used to do. Doesn't he realize that his mom didn't have to work too? You know, we're a two-income home now. You know, so she's grousing at her husband. And her husband says, oh, my mom used to get up early and have breakfast on the table for dad. Now dinner was always ready on time and the clothes were washed and pressed. Why can't my wife do that? And she expects me to help her to do the little she does. She doesn't realize that her dad worked a 40 hour a week job 10 minutes from home. I work 60 hours a week and commute four hours a day. And so he's a grousing at her. Notice each one has the flow of expectations reversed. Each one is expecting of the other towards self. Now, some other interesting things to notice here. Notice that all the points are valid. And this is where we get stuck. All the points are valid. Now, he's right. You know, her dad didn't have to, have to work an extra 20 hours a week and commute, a crazy commute. You know, worked at the factory, the whistle blew, you came home, and it was done. You know, and the woman is right. You know, her, her mom, his mom was a stay-at-home mom, and she's got to work, and she's got to do all this other stuff, too. Are you crazy? No, I don't wear a cape and fly through the air. Some may think that, but I don't, right? All the points are valid. Most arguments have valid points on both sides. Except for one. I, I, I first thought this was a true story. It was told to me by, by a minister. And then I've heard it making the ministry, ministerial round. So I don't know if it's out of the ministerial joke book or whether it was actually a real counseling event. But this minister was, was telling us that um, 
you know, most of the time he finds this is true, that most arguments have got valid points all along, except for one. Had this couple that came into him, this older couple, and he's counseling with them after a while, and it's, it's, and it's apparent that the husband is a real idiot, just a miserable, miserable man. And so one day he's talking to the wife alone, and he says, you know, most of the time I sit down with couples and I say, look, there are problems on both sides, but in your case, it really is one side. This guy is, is off his rocker. How have you put up with it all these years? She says, well, don't tell anyone, but every morning I get up before he does, and I take his toothbrush, and I swirl it in the toilet, and then I put it back. <laughs> so if you ever wake up in the morning and find your toothbrush wet when you don't expect it, you know, something might be, might be going on. <laughs> But in any event, the point is that most arguments like we're seeing here actually have valid points on both sides. So what happens when you have valid points all around? It depends on the direction of the flow of expectations. If the flow of expectations is inward towards myself, the relationship tends to sour. Because we're focused on all the points where we're right. And the other person is focused on all the points where they're right. And there we go, the, the Viking movie, you know, attack, defend, attack, defend, attack, defend. And our relationships become like this, right? Whereas when the flow of expectations is outward, from myself towards other, the relationship deepens because we recognize that there are valid points so along, so we explore them, we try to accommodate them, because our expectation of, our, of ourselves towards our other person is all about them, not about the valid points I can make, but the valid points they make that I can accommodate. In Christian relationships, that are mature and healthy. Expect nothing of the other and everything from yourself. That means you won't always get what you want. But Christianity isn't getting what you want. Getting what you want is not the Christian life. In fact, when we make the conscious decision to live a life of love, we make the conscious decision to live a life that exposes us to being exploited, that exposes us to being taken advantage of. Now, in wisdom, we try not to do that because it saps our resources for others. But we must be willing to be so. Why not be defrauded, we hear the words of Paul, rather than suffer such defeat? Okay, so expect nothing from other and everything from you. We won't always get what we want, but getting what we want is not the Christian life. That's the life of hell. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. This is why we've gone this route, to lead us to this transformational Christianity. Because so often, again, we fall into this trap of Christianity as being a nice person and going to church on Sunday. This is an awful lot deeper than being a nice person and going to church on Sunday. This is counting the cost of discipleship. Unless we renounce all things, we cannot be his disciple. Expect everything of ourselves and nothing from other. And forget about seeking what we want. Another one, just for kicks. Parent-child. Why can't I go to the school dance? It's the biggest one the school has ever had. I've never been to one before. And I can't believe they say they can't afford it. But they can afford to go to a weekend trip to the Marriott. I can't believe that she's so upset over a stupid dance. Doesn't she realize we've sacrificed to be a single income family so she can have a mother at home and we just don't have the money? 
Then she gets upset because we're going away. Doesn't she realize we haven't done that in 16 years and our marriage desperately needs it? But look at the argument again. Valid points all around. Which way are we flowing? So, in these relationships where we have some challenges, ask ourselves, what is the direction of our flow of expectations? Now, bringing it back to Bible study, not understanding these things can get us into serious Bible trouble. And let's look at some pretty volatile, inflammatory, confrontational, and dangerous scriptures in the Bible. Ephesians 5, verse 21. I have literally seen people get up and walk out of mass or services when this is read. Yet it kills me sometimes when people skip over it because it's in there and there's no making it go away. Ephesians 5, 21. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. As the church is subject to Christ, so let wives also be subject in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Even so, Husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no man ever hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it as Christ does the church. Because we are members of his body. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is a profound one, and I am saying it refers to Christ and the church. We referred to that quite a while ago, the importance of the marital relationship and its symbolism of our literal unity with Christ, just as there is a unity, a physical unity within marriage. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respect her husband. All right, this one has caused all kinds of grief. First thing to remember is that it's all prefaced by be subject to one another. Okay. But yes, wives be subject to your husbands. In fact, it was about another case of where there is a need for wisdom. About the 1930s, there was a document, an encyclical that came out of Rome addressing this scripture in the modern context. It's called Casti Canubi. You know, that talks about practical implications. What do you do? The scripture is in the Bible. What do you do when you just have a lazy, no good, irresponsible a husband or an abusive one? And it's filled with all kinds of wisdom of how to live this, this scripture in the modern context. But the point here that I'm trying to make is how we have seen these scriptures abused, usually by men when the flow of expectations is reversed. So what have you been told? Wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives as Christ has loved the church. Okay, so what happens when we get this flow of expectations backwards? The husband expects the wife to submit and forgets about the love part, and when she doesn't, gets all bent out of shape. And not just bent out of shape, awful things happen. I've seen men under the guise of this scripture in Christianity just belittle their wives, abuse their wives, sexually assault their wives. This is dreadfully wrong. This is anything but Christianity. This is deep and profound sin. Husbands disciplining their wives like they're, they're young children. It's 
stupid, sinful men. What are you doing? Because we've got this flow of expectations backwards and we're expecting the wife to submit. Uh, we got things backwards. The expectation of the wife towards you should be that out of love for you, she submits in the symbolism of Christ in the church. Your job, man, is to have a flow of expectations that's outward and to say the part that I need to focus on is not this part, it's the part that says, husbands love your wives as Christ gave himself for the church. Who's got the taller order there? And when I as a man start to expect of myself to love my wife beyond my own flesh, beyond my own life, beyond my own desires, beyond my own self-interest, how can I possibly impose upon my wife and be belittling towards her and demeaning towards her? That's not my expectation of myself of the scripture. So we can see how dangerous this is. I have heard this scripture thumped over women's heads so many times it's sickening. Because the flow of expectations is backwards. So it's scripturally practical. And it doesn't end there. This is the one we usually hear about, but you know what? It continues right on the next chapter of Ephesians. Let's keep going. Ephesians 6. I can get my mouse to go there. Come on. There we go. Ephesians 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. <laughs> you know, honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Again, which way is the flow of expectations? When we've got it backwards, ah, I'm the parent, you're the child, of course. I expect obedience. Forgot about the love part. Forgot about the not provoking to anger part. You're just supposed to obey. Didn't you read it there? And we wonder why our kids don't want to come back to church. Okay. And likewise, children, and hopefully, in submission to the scripture, having expectations of themselves to obey. How much healthier is the relationship when it flows that way? Imagine families where the children are expecting of themselves obedience and love and respect, and the parents are expecting of themselves to not provoke and antagonize and infuriate their children. Much, much healthier relationship when the flow of expectations is outward when the flow of expectations is based upon love, the righteousness that exceeds that of the Pharisees. And it goes on, verse 5. Often the scriptures about slave-master relationships are very helpful for employee-employer relationships. Okay, slavery was just so common in the Roman Empire, just ran on it. Okay, and there were, there were many cases where we had Christians who were slaves, we had Christians who were slave owners, and sometimes we had Christian masters owning Christian slaves. Okay. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your earthly masters, with fear and trembling and singleness of heart as to Christ, not in the way of eye service and men pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same again from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. Masters, do the same to them and forbear threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. How often have I seen in the church small businesses hiring people within the church and we get in trouble? Okay, where suddenly the employees start having these expectations. Ah, oh, he's, he's, he's my brother in the church. I, he'll understand if I'm tired because I went to Bible study and I just take a snap on the job. You know, he'll understand if I just you know, take this home because I, I need to use it. Okay. 
or the employer saying, yeah, he's a brother, he understands that things are tight, so I, I can expect to not pay him for that overtime that he worked. And this happens a lot because the flow of expectations is backwards. We pull out these scriptures and we beat each over the, over the head with it, with them. Because I, as the boss, am saying, you're okay, servant, you're supposed to do this. And I, as the employee, is saying, okay, boss, you're supposed to do that. Instead of looking at what applies to us. Which way is the flow of expectations? So, let's look at a couple of examples of relationships working the right way. Relationships working in a healthy way, with this righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, with this outward flow of expectations. Look at 1 Corinthians 10, verses 23 to 33. 1 Corinthians 10, 23 to 33. Okay, so there are lots of questions about conscience um, in Corinth. I think we spoke about this earlier. You know, that often, you know, meat was used in sacrifice. You know, and typically, even in the Old Covenant, you typically didn't, didn't need a whole lot of meat unless you had brought it for a sacrifice. And there's a sacrifice, and the priest gets his portion, you get your portion, and that's when you eat your meat. Okay, and so in this Gentile society, there's this concern about eating this food, sacrifice to idols, um, whether we should be eating you know, meat at all. All these questions are coming up, and they're causing problems in the church. And so Paul says, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good but the good of his neighbor. Sound awfully familiar? Eat whatever is sold in the market without raising any question on the ground of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If one of the unbelievers invites you to go to dinner and you're disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. It's okay for you to do this. You have a right to do this. It's okay. But, if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then out of consideration for the man who informed you, and for conscience's sake, I mean conscience, not yours, his conscience, not yours, do not eat it. Well, wait a sec, I have a right to eat it, that's not fair. No, don't eat it. For why should my liberty be determined by another man's scruples? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of that for which I give thanks? So whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. But give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I try to please all men in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of the many, that they may be saved. See how Paul is talking about this flow of expectation. Yes, I have a right to do it, but for somebody else's sake, my expectation of myself towards them is to sacrifice for their sake, even that to which I have a right. Okay, we see this again in Romans. Look at Romans 14, verse 13. Romans 14, verse 13. <clears throat> then let us no more pass judgment on one another, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it unclean. If your brother is being injured by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. Do not let what you eat cause the ruin of one for whom Christ died. Do not let your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not food and drink. Detachment. Renunciation. For the kingdom of God is not food and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. He who thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. Let us then pursue what makes for peace 
and for mutual upbuilding. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make others fall by what he eats. It is right not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that makes your brother stumble. The faith that you have keep between yourself and God. Happy is he who has no reason to judge himself for what he approves. But he who has doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not act from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Also sound familiar? Okay, we continue on to the next chapter for a, for a few verses. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Flow of expectations flowing outward towards others. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to edify him. For Christ did not please himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. How are we doing in our relationships? How are we measuring up? Maybe really well. Maybe not so well. When we reverse the flow of expectations, we're doing something pretty dangerous and pretty ugly. We're doing what James talks about in James 4 and verse 11. James 4, 11 and 12. When we start having expectations of others towards us, and start having problems because other is not meeting our expectations toward ourselves. What are we doing when we condemn like that? Do not speak evil against one another, brethren. He that speaks evil against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver and judge he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you that you judge your neighbor? Ooh, ouch. Okay, when we have the flow of expectations backwards, when we are judging others because of their failure to meet our expectations towards us, what are we doing and who do we think we are? See how when we start looking through the eyes of love, we start seeing how stupid the world is and how insane the world is and frankly how stupid we are lots of times, at least I am. We get things so backwards. So I would ask, if you're experiencing strife in relationships, ask yourself, what's the flow of your expectations? Christians, always flow outward. I think we'll actually, we'll, we'll transgress, I know it's time to knock off, but we're actually at the end of this entire first section that we've been covering for months now. Let's just wrap up with this last scripture. I think the rest of the stuff we can dispense with. Yeah, we can, we can get rid of the rest. Let's just cover this one last slide because we started this whole night on the Sermon on the Mount, right? So let's at least finish up this first chapter, chapter five. Remember what the theme of this section has been. The whole thing has been about, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So in the beginning we see the Beatitudes, a description of how to be, not what to do. Then we see the illustration of the problem with the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. You don't hate, I mean, you don't kill, but you have hate. You don't commit adultery, but you have lust, and you have broken relationships. Okay, then we see this illustration of Christians always love, even those who hurt you. And we turn the other cheek. And then we come to this stunning conclusion. Matthew 5, starting in verse 43. 
Matthew 5, starting in verse 43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, right? Right out of the law. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, the romantic dinner, the human good of which we must repent because it's not adequate for heaven, righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you salute only your brethren, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Sermon on the Mount look a little different tonight? <laughs> no, we're not going to hell. Be not be because God has promised. That's actually what we cover next. Is we we've set the bar. We've set what the plan is. We've outlined the, the picture on the, on the puzzle cover. And now we've looked at this great scripture. And we've found ourselves perhaps seriously confronted that this Christianity thing was a little bigger than be a nice person as you think and go to church on Sunday. This Christianity thing is really deep. This cost of discipleship is renounce all things. Lose ourselves and do the love that God puts in front of us. Always be perfect as your heavenly Father in heaven is perfect. How? That's the next section of study we'll cover to put the Bible in perspective. All right. So again, feel free to put up questions and thoughts and ask them. We can, we can address them again next time. Uh, big transition as, as we go into our next section. But this is the plan. And it's an amazing plan because we sit here at the end of it and say, no way, no how. And God says, yep, don't worry. I got you covered. So with that, let's give thanks and head on our way. Our Father, who is perfect, who is perfect in ways beyond which we even imagine or know or comprehend, who is perfect in a love that we, we struggled even to get to the starting blocks, and yet just the fact that you're okay with that is, is your love. Please, our Father, again, what more can we ask and help us take these words, take this Bible, Take this life and this example of your son. And please, just help us be like you. For in that is everything that needs to be. And this we ask through Christ, our Savior and Redeemer. Amen. So, thank you all. See you next week.